Welcome to this Learn at Work webinar presented by the journal Work, a journal of prevention, assessment, and rehabilitation. I'm Karen Jacobs, the founding um, editor of this journal, and I'm going to turn it over now to our speaker. So, oh, good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening from Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, here, it's a winter landscape, and I'm sitting here in the middle part of Stockholm, and I'm going to uh, talk about a retreat concept that we have developed here in Sweden with colleagues. So, who am I? I am uh, Eva Boiner Horvitz, a professor uh, working with music and health here at the Royal College of Music and at Karolinska Institutet in Stockholm, Sweden. So thank you for letting me share uh, this research project. And I will now continue, if that is all right with you, Karen, uh, with the presentation. Taking care of the researcher, a nature and art related activity retreat, sharing natural space, put humanity in perspective. So this is the title of an article that we have published with you. Uh, and uh, the, I'm trying now to understand how to, yeah. And so our question is, how, how do we support academic working life of researchers? So we wanted to examine the use of a nature and art related activity retreat designed for researchers. So we evaluated an international group of researchers experiences after a three day retreat with a follow up after three months. And we did a focus group interview and there were three major themes that I will identify and present later on. So this systematizing and organizing retreats with different purposes, uh, I think we have time to discuss that. So retreat programs are often used in rehabilitation uh, situations with patients uh, and reducing employees' burnout and stress, increasing quality of life and improving educational and leadership abilities, but very little is known about the effectiveness of these activities. And in work environments, one of the main causes of burnout seems to be work-related stress, which may negatively impact the quality of work as seen in, for example, the healthcare sector today. And one risk factor for ill health is physical inactivity, and the World Health Organization ranks it as the fourth most common cause of death in the world, causing 6% of deaths. As health supporting work environments, including opportunities for physical exercise and academic walks, become more common in our universities, we are beginning now to understand how this is linked both to better health and to possibly new learning environments for both students and staff. So for academic researchers, the use of retreats is not yet commonly presented in the evidence-based literature, and thus evaluations are also scarce. So the increasing administrative burden, as well as the pressure to publish or perish, is well known. And this is a quotation that we has have used in the publications. Researchers are pushed to complete, compete more than ever, which often generates attitudes and professional behavior that are inappropriate, counterproductive, and undermine any cooperative behavior. So having this in mind, we also need to understand uh, how the stress and the, this restorative effects of nature can be used. And because spending time in nature has been shown to have positive health effects, we know a lot about that. And there are researchers here in Sweden who are looking into nature-related environments and also urban-related environments and compare them. <clears throat> so we, we know a lot about the prevention of stress and we know that the reduction of stress due to overwork and to advance advancements of learning, these are things seen in our literature and in our research reports here from Sweden. 
So the different natural landscapes can be systematized as restorative in relation to different needs. So when evaluating, for example, and explaining stress and its relation to restoration theories such as, we use theories such as the attention restoration theory, maybe you have heard and used that, perceived stress theories and also psychophysiological stress theories. And uh, improved cognitive performance has been another factor used to measure and evaluate contact with nature. And I will also mention Cecilia Stenfors here in Sweden. They collaborate with Chicago uh, University and have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of references to this also in, included in, in the research report that you maybe have read. So a pertinent finding from such studies is that the natural environment can be more beneficial than the built environment in relation to human health development and that being outdoors seem to be positively associated with vitality. And studies have also shown improved physio physiology, such as lower blood pressure, for example, and reduced stress levels in relation to the natural environment as compared to urban environments. So with, the, with that in mind, and with, with the theories in mind, and with the understanding that we need to be aware of uh, the capacity that we have outdoor, we explore, we, we have different themes of, of the, our retreats, but this theme of this retreat is taking care of the researcher. We are also having themes as taking care of the musician, taking care of the student, etc., in the name of sustainability and the Agenda 2030 today. But uh, in this case, we explore the use of nature and art-related activities at the three-day academic retreat with a mixed group of six female researchers from Sweden, Finland, and the United States in the archipelago of Stockholm in Sweden. So as I mentioned earlier, we did a focus group interview with all the participants directly after the retreat on day three, and also a follow-up three month, months after the retreat with follow-up questionnaires to all the participants. So the aim of this pilot study was to explain in what ways, if any, a focused program using nature and art related activities for researchers in a natural setting away from the dense, hyperactive urban environment in which many researchers work, as we are, could be beneficial. So the research questions to summarize those first, how do we organize a nature and art related activity for researchers? How do we as researchers perceive and communicate in an hour retreat? Which health factors do we find meaningful and important regarding taking care of ourselves as researchers? And the fourth step, after three months, what has been the perceived impact of the retreat? What, if any, was meaningful and useful? So I will now go into more details. So the arts practices selected for the retreat included singing, yoga, expressive writing, expressive movement, dance, drawing, drumming, culture-specific expression and nutrition. And the workshops were approximately one and a half hour long and were scheduled at a specific time on the retreat agenda. And the entire group of the six female researchers took part in each of the different workshops together. And also there were uh, embodied knowledge uh, in all of us that presented the different uh, artistic uh, packages, I will call them. I will come back to that later. So in more detail, the different workshops or packages. The first one was singing and rhythmic dance workshop. And the other one was an expressive writing workshop, a yoga workshop, a nature-based dance workshop, a mindful eating workshop, and a selfie drawing and life course dance workshop, and a dance and drum workshop. And as I said, the, each workshop took place for 90 minutes, and there was also verbal reflecting and sharing for 15 minutes after each workshop. So after the different workshops, the participants share their experience from the exercises and their taking part in the retreat overall during a focus group interview lasting two and a half hours. 
and uh, all data was digitally recorded and the participants listened to each other's experiences during this focus group at the end of day three. And the data was collected directly after the end of the retreat on this island before participants left the retreat area. And the recordings were then transcribed. And three months later, uh, so three months after the end of the retreat, the participants were asked to reflect on their retreat experience in a written form. They were asked to give a reflection on the whole of the retreat in response to two prompts. First one, is there something specific that stayed with you? Something with which you retain as a symbol or memento from the retreat? And the second one, if and how have you used something from the retreat in a specific situation, maybe a stressful or demanding one? So the participants also gave two ratings regarding meaningfulness and also usefulness. And we used a visual analog scale ranking from one to 10. So all the participants send the ratings directly to the researcher responsible of data collection on the project and did not see each other's ratings. So this was the follow-up reflection after three months. So, so here we can see the three different themes from the results, and I will go very more uh, in depth on each one of those. The first one was about sharing and connecting. The second one was about embodiment, and the third one, nature. So we, when we look at this uh, word box, word cloud here, you can also see the most common used words in uh, the focus group. So you can see there are there's the experience word, dance, nature, retreat, etc. And uh, time, felt, and different, and movement. So those were the most common used words uh, from the interview. That was just, and in the results also, the workshop experienced as the most useful were the yoga and the mindful eating workshop. That means that they were ranked the highest in the VAS uh, ranking, the visual analog scale ranking. As for the meaningfulness, the workshops experienced as the most meaningful were the nature-based dance and the self-figure drawing and the dance workshop. And this self-figure drawing context, uh, maybe you have used it and never heard about it. It's about draw a picture of your body as feel in your body right now and this is standardized and it's also a methodology that is presented in the research literature uh, when it comes to uh, for example in art related therapies and art uh, related work situations it's a non-verbal uh, drawing and you can if you would like to to interpret also your own drawing or your own self-figure drawing and let the others uh, hear what you, how you would like to interpret your own self-figure drawing. So there's no one else that is interpreting your own drawing. So how and with what vocabularies are the themes of well-being discussed in the material among the retreat participants? Two of the most prominent themes in the materials were sharing, as I said, in connection, and the theme of embodiment was significantly more prominent in the material than the themes of, for example, spirituality, spiritual growth, or self-expression. This was quite interesting because the theme of the retreat was taking care of the researcher, and there were less vocabulary related to, to uh, ego-centered uh, uh, health issues more eco it's like from ego to echo uh, in uh, yeah to summarize this so i would now like to share with you uh, the different uh, themes and related and relate the, these to the literature so sharing and connecting may be interpreted as a driving force for authenticity and vulnerability where age, titles, and background do not have an influence. 
And this is also seen in uh, our work, for example, in healthcare centers where we use artistic work and uh, culture activities with the staff and with uh, staff together with patients. And we see that there is this space where age titles and, and background doesn't uh, is not in, in, in the participants' focus. It doesn't have an influence. So in comparison with previous healthcare packages with artistic activities taking place indoors, also the activities used in this study seem to evoke a deeper sense of sharing and connecting among the participants. So this being outdoor, there is something specific with that. And I will also relate that to the fractal theory that we have uh, tried to uh, explore in relation to the outdoor activities. And the retreat workshop are both useful and meaningful to the participants. And no single workshop nor a single activity is accountable for the effect seen. This is something also that we have discussed. So this theory of you, uh, Otto Schirmer has uh, explored and explained the theory of you, the German researcher. And so the process of letting go of professional lives and letting in of caring lives may have established a connection to deeper source of knowing and bears resemblance to this theory of you, which states that when we start to listen to each other by, quote here from Otto Schamer's work, co-initiating a common intention via co-sensing by listening within, we can allow the inner knowing to emerge. And this knowledge is reached by the so-called pre-sensing state. So thereafter, the co-creating leads to the co-evolving when we can act through an embodied wholeness. All those states are involved in Shamer's theory U. So um, we have used theory of U as one of the explanations uh, how and why we are more neutral uh, in relation to each other. Uh, we are not that focused on age, professional titles, etc. when we are outdoor in nature doing activities, artistic activities together. And embodiment was also uh, another factor that we seen in the results here. So embodiment was often linked with nature in the text, being part of the nature in the text from the focus groups, focus group. And through that connection, the participants were also able to better listen to themselves. So this being part of the nature, being a wholeness, the brain's Modality specific systems are constituted by a combination of different processes. We are talking here about the sensory systems, which regulate perception. We have the motor systems, which trigger actions, and the introspective system, which govern conscious experiences of emotion and cognitions. So this, uh, those uh, different processes here is related to embodiment theory, and you have. Uh, of course, also uh, heard about the, the Damasio, how, how he puts it, the, we feel there for we learn concept. So this is also meaningful to relate to or link to our findings. Feeling, we feel and therefore we learn something. I think this is also a key factor uh, when we have used the embodiment theory to understand that the, this the, the co-sensing from theory U and also being a part of nature could be related to the embodiment theory. And another dimension, which uh, a lot of people nowadays here in Sweden, in Nordic countries, are focusing on the Fibonacci's fract fractal dimension. So the, the qualitative nature of the natural environment could have evoked a sense of meaning. The golden ratio of the Fibonacci numbers presented in the literature helps us to feel safe and to feel meaning from the repetition of fractals seen in nature, natural patterns to which we automatically attach our gaze. So this could be seen as an important contributor to the trustful sharing in this retreat group. 
in this retreat uh, in, in between the participants. So when looking more in, in, in detail, the Fibonacci fractal, everything we have around us there on the island, the trees, and uh, we can uh, we started also to, to pick things from nature and we started to understand the interrelation between natural materials and bodies and how this link between the uh, perception of nature also is interrelated to the perception of our bodies. So this sort of organic uh, relation, we, we, build inform we build some knowledge from the Fibonacci's fractal dimension to understand this, to make this more understandable. Another uh, state that we have discussed in this study is about the wakefully relaxed state. This is also uh, presented in the literature as a factor on nature-based activities and can be evaluated from brain signals when perceiving fractal patterns from nature. This state is an interesting one to relate to the openness and compassionate mindset reported between the participants during the retreat. So wakeful and at the same time relaxed. And I can imagine that we, if we look at the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system here, we can understand that there need to be a balance, there need to be a sort of equilibrium, whatever you call it, equilibrium between the two systems. You are wakeful and you are relaxed at the same time. This state is also reminds me of the flow state, the flow state where we can concentrate and we can do something that is quite hard for us to do and at the same time uh, sharing with others. For example, this uh, flow, uh, and there is a Hungarian researcher and his name is uh, Michael Sixman Mikhai. He uh, explored or pre presented flow for the first time during the 70, 1970s. And I think we also see now when we measure, for example, musicians and the interplay between musicians in our studies that the, the flow factor is also very uh, something very healthy. It's a balance in, in between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. So this wakefully relaxed state, we need to go more to, to uh, look deeper into but this, this state is interpreted as part of the clarity of mind also in relation to flow actually, that was described as being shared by the participants and as linked to the relaxed social climate seen in the results of the content analysis. So to bear in mind the wakefully relaxed state. And as there were no business center here on the island, there were no PowerPoint or other technolo technologically mediated presentations, as this one is, <laughs> uh, individuals shared rooms and bathrooms looking out to the nature and the sea. So we didn't have any computers. And this was also uh, part of uh, a sentence here in the uh, focus group. There is no business center involved here. And a business center can also be, we have all, all I think the researchers before this COVID era, we, when we hear the business center, we start to increase our uh, heart activity a little bit because we know we need to go through the business center to be able to have the material that we need. But when you, we don't have that, we need to feel some trust within our bodies that we will reach, we will get the information that we need <laughs> in this uh, island to be able to follow the different workshops. So I wrote here, they assisted with setting out and cl cleaning up prepared meals and stayed in close proximately to one another throughout the retreat time. Yes, we saw that in this group there uh, it, it was, can you imagine, uh, being without a computer during three days, isn't that something to think about? So I think this was a lot of, uh, yeah, we need to think about this uh, business-centered mind, What what's what does that mean for stress reactions? So here, uh, 
the revitalization from nature into play. So creativity and problem solving are common human attributes. And however, in, in striving to incentivize and support good research, interventions and programs generally target skills and tools rather than supporting the researcher's innate capacities. So as compared with indoor creative activities targeted toward the alleviation of burnout, the outdoor activities seem to be able to provide self-care to a broader and perhaps also deeper extent because they involve senses that are triggered and evoked from interplay with nature. So here we also have an interesting uh, space in between uh, the body and the body of the nature, this interplay going on there. How do we read trees? How do we interconnect uh, bodies with, with uh, nature bodies? And how do we collaborate in this sense without our computers? And how do we solve problems uh, there in this interplay? And I think the word flow, again, we can discuss this uh, uh, after the presentation, what you think about this flow concept in relation to this. So another thing, in, in nature, we cannot maintain our faca facades. So nature presents us with contrast to urban academic lives. It can be sort of upside down, unstructured, not designed, not owned. So especially for academics, I think uh, this is a sort of an, which I tried to show in this, this picture here, it's a little bit like for, for an acad academic um, group of, well, researchers here, this is a little bit how the nature helps us to look into the world in a sort of upside down perspective. So we would argue that it is essential that retreat interventions are nature-based in order that we are able to tune in to the primitive parts of ourselves. This is also uh, something that we would like to discuss. So the participants didn't talk about their physical health and effects. This was not focused even though the explicit purpose of the retreat was to take care of the researcher. I think this is also interesting to analyze uh, the vocabulary here. There were no, so the importance of sharing a workshop that had previously been embodied by one of the researchers participating may also have played a part in establishing this intimacy and trust. So letting each participant contribute an activity may be a key to the success of the intervention. There was sort of an embodied knowledge from each one of the research that presented and uh, was in charge of the workshops. Uh, but I think here we, it's also uh, interesting to, to look at the vocabulary here. They, they didn't talk about their, themselves in that sense about pain or how they felt. It was more sharing, communicating in this uh, connection with nature that was more of a key factor in the communication. So uh, research-based retreats become more and more popular in the quest to halt the epidemic of workplace stress and burnout. And uh, when I'm sitting here at the campus uh, in Stockholm, or, uh, we have a lot of trees, we have a lot of forest, we, but we very, very rarely use, we, we, we rarely do lectures outside, outdoor. And this is also interesting when we have a lot of uh, restorative space outside our windows, but we are sitting there in our square rooms, in front of the computers, having the technology easy at hand, etc., etc. So, a further contribution of this study is to argue that we need to develop new or extended vocabularies regarding available interventions to be able to investigate the researchers' well being in the future. So, nature visits and retreats 
may need to be better represented in the curriculum of academic life. And uh, I will also conclude this by seeing that there has been insufficient study about way to about ways the primary research instrument, the person who generates the study's hypothesis, can be supported. So findings point to ideas where nature could be incorporated in selected intense intellectual pursuits, such as inaugurating courses and orienting research communities and space. And a feature of finding is that a nature-based retreat fosters trust. So this is also another key word, trust. Trust is uh, sort of a key factor in all social processes, I think. And, and when we look at our societies today, we need really to understand how we can build more trust within our communities. So creative space to engage common purpose and individual ingenuity was found Sharing natural space was felt by participants to put humanity in, into perspective, connecting with the social goals of research. So we have, yeah, we haven't found so many studies about taking care of researchers. And I think this concept, when we share our expertise as researchers with embodied knowledge into different artistic activities and culture activities and bring it into space, outdoor space, share our knowledge with the purpose to take care of uh, ourselves as researchers. I think this, this sharing on natural space to put, to put this humanity into perspective is truly a meaningful door opener or opening for us to to continue to to see how how can we use this uh, in in the our future collaboration so organizing and systematizing health preventive interventions and retreats for research in academia is an important part of the sustainable academic community in which our researcher needs to be better taken care of in a more embodied way so although this study was conducted prior to COVID-19, such retreats and potentially also online versions could be useful for managing through the pandemic and afterwards in our new normal. And this was a collaboration between uh, Georgetown University, Turku University of Applied Sciences, Karolinska Institute in Stockholm and Royal College of Music in Stockholm. So, we are uh, now uh, continuing to work with this concept and because we are uh, are uh, targeting the agenda 2030 we are trying to work with the SDGs to be able to uh, take care of uh, our students uh, well more sustainable future working life and we are also uh, doing retreats for uh, teachers, well, musicians, students, and uh, the concept that we have started to frame here in this study and published uh, at work, the Journal of Work, uh, it was uh, an important part of uh, our, uh, uh, it was an important part to open up the collaboration. So now we are also organizing retreats with uh, in in Georgetown and with Georgetown we are bringing researchers together and we have planned this last year but then we postpone it uh, so we're going to do this when we open up uh, after the COVID-19. And there are also initiatives in Turku and, and in, in Finland and also here in Stockholm. So we are Continuous, continuing to uh, work with this concept in, uh, in, in many different universities. Uh, I didn't really present myself in the beginning, but maybe I can say something who I am. Uh, this is a short bio and uh, I'm working at the moment as a professor of music and health here at the Royal College of Music in Stockholm. 
and I'm also affiliated with the Department of Clinical Neuroscience at Karolinska Institute. And uh, I'm a social professor in social medicine and a culture health researcher, and I'm specialized in psychosomatic medicine and the creative arts. And we, we uh, funded, we, I'm a co-founder of the Center for Social Sustainability at Karolinska Institute. Nine years ago, we started to build this center where uh, cultural activities and artistic activities uh, is a key factor to build trust within healthcare systems, school systems, etc. So I have uh, authored scientific articles and you can find them in ResearchGate and uh, I've written different books and uh, I'm also supervising doctoral students in different, <clears throat> different areas uh, and I also uh, work with cultural activities and healthcare systems, as I said earlier. And I have worked with different uh, evaluations with video interpretation technique, with, with stress hormone analysis, and also we are uh, evaluating now flow uh, in musicians and their audience and in actors and dancers in, with their audience, and we are measuring heart rate variability to see what's going on in the body when we are uh, into this flow state, the individual state and group flow state. So uh, we are also at the moment working with music and end of life situations, how we can use music uh, for COVID patients in end of life situations, how we can work with uh, intensive care with music. And uh, yes, this, uh, we have also a, a European uh, project now working with health education if in our artistic programs, how we can bridge uh, or fill the gap between different educational programs to use artistic work to increase health within our uh, educational systems. So we are sort of building a different tool, a toolbox for this uh, with uh, other countries here in Europe. So this was uh, what I wanted to share with you tonight. Uh, here you can see my uh, email address if you would like to, to ask something after uh, today's presentation. And I go back to you, Karen, now uh, if you have any questions uh, or comments. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank, yeah, Eva, thank you. I wish you could see me applauding you. Um, this was a, a wonderful study and you did a great uh, job presenting. I actually unmuted um, the attendees and um, I don't usually do that, but I know um, the three that are on right now. Um, so Jennifer, Sue or Susan, do you have a question for Eva? And even perhaps, um, I just want to give you a little connection with me. Um, I did my doctoral um, work, my study was on flow many, oh. many, many <laughs> years ago. Such a long time. Okay. But I did study flow in um, occupational therapy practitioners. So um, it's a such an interesting construct. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think your, um, the retreat, everything that you have done is so important. So hopefully COVID will be behind us and um, you've shared a lot of collaboration that you're doing, but if you were to design something that, you know, you didn't have limitations geographically or um, perhaps financially, what would that study be like? What would you want to do? This is a, a wonderful question. Thank you for this question. And Karen, I would, <clears throat> because we see there is a lot of burnout now in a lot of systems. And when I talk about systems, I mean school systems, educational systems, and healthcare systems. We are overloaded with uh, work and we very, rarely uh, prioritate uh, being in nature, even, even though we know 
that we can easily reach this state of flow out in, 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 in the nature. So I would like to uh, collaborate with different universities all over the world to, uh, to do retreats and to share the knowledge, the embodied knowledge uh, digitally and to build up uh, a platform of uh, knowledge from nature-related activities in nature uh, with a lot of interdisciplinary research groups. So to, to continue to uh, gather uh, this and to build this vocabulary that we need, uh, which is, I think this, this was uh, the, the no business center to what is the opposite of the business center? What kind of uh, uh, platforms do we need to sustain our health and to be continuously to be creative, to feel that it's fun to continue with our research, not to uh, 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 not not to compete, but to the opposite or compete, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Those are themes I would like to work with in the future. I'd love that. Um, you know, and I'll give a, a little personal aspect. So typically, uh, I live in Boston and in a dormitory at the, at the university. I've been there for quite a few years. But when yeah. COVID happened, um, we moved up to New Hampshire where we have, you know, um, a fixer upper home. And it's in nature. It's not yeah. a pond. There are birds, there are trees. And just walking outside um, as much as I can each day, is so rejuvenating. And I look forward to when COVID's behind mm -hmm. us to have retreats here because I oh, think yeah. what we've done um, is wonderful. So, um, so oh. Susan, Susan yeah. please ask a question. Thank you. So by the way, thank you both. Um, Karen has always been such a strong presence for so many of us, uh, both in occupational therapy and pretty much anybody that meets her on the street or anywhere on the continent. Uh, but Eva, your, your presentation and your scholarship um, resonates. Um, I, I think even, I believe Sue, I, I don't know her married name, but uh, Sue Coppola in North Carolina and I'm in Kentucky, the Appalachian arts are very much a part of you know, our community, our experience, and I'm at Eastern Kentucky University, which is, um, you know, we consider ourselves an applied science uh, regional university. Uh, and our music department has always been our hub and our favorite um, uh, collaborator in our research. So uh, I yeah. love what you're saying, and I, I just think that, because I'm actually doing work on, uh, expanding OT's role in disaster management. So we've we've launched, we have a disaster management program in our safety and justice department. Um, yeah. And we're starting to reach out and say, you know, there's so many pieces of that cycle. And uh, I think what you're speaking to is for so many academics that maybe they had been extraordinarily seasoned in their face-to-face -face lecturing skills, they've had to convert to having technology in a layer that can be almost, um, uh, it's almost toxic, uh, but I, I really love your, your research. So that's what I was just gonna say, I see the, receipt, the retreat approach as being so meaningful. Oh, I'm very happy to hear that you share that. And, and uh, it would be very uh, nice if we have time also to, to discuss uh, what, what's, what's the sound of nature, the sounds mm -hmm. and, uh, how, how we work with musicians in nature, etc. But we can do that next time. <laughs> and it would be wonderful to, to continue to work with this retreat concept with, with you. Uh, well, yeah, this. Yeah, that's wonderful. And so you're looking for more collaborators, it sounds like. And I am, absolutely. I am, because we, we know we, we need to invite nature we need to also understand that we can't uh, we, we we need to uh, collaborate also with <clears throat> the animal animals more I for myself we have a dog for example and now we know uh, with dogs uh, that can 
also helping. Unfortunately, my, my husband, he has been very, very uh, sick with, with COVID. But the, the amazing thing is that our dog can easily also help to, uh, he, uh, our dog can uh, read the pre-signals when my husband is getting, uh, uh, before read his pre-signals before he can read them himself. It's like, uh, there is so many many things with with animals also that is uh, related to nature of course that we haven't re at all is spoken about today but the, 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 this oxytocin effect that we also view mm -hmm. dogs birds listen to bird song how, how that increases the oxytocin levels in our bodies this is also part of the retreat experience but this was, you know, on the, on the surface, we have started with this, we have presented some key aspects here and we can dig deeper into them and uh, continue to do more retreat together. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Eva, I'm so grateful that you submitted your work to the work journal because this is extremely important to um, our roles as workers and roles as just human beings. Um, you may or may not know that on the Work Journal website, we actually have a blog on nature that Amy Wagenfeld um, writes. Um, oh. and, and she's an occupational therapist who um, has been studying nature and its impact. So go on to the Work Journal website, workjournal.org, yes. and you can read um, what Amy is doing. And I, one last thing on a personal note. You know, I've been, we've been up here in New Hampshire since, oh boy, since almost when COVID started and haven't seen family members, some in over a year. And for my birthday in January, I got us a gift, a bird feeder. And um, mm. that has brought so much joy. Um, <laughs> I'm learning about birds, but the sound, you're totally right. Um, it's, it's really made a difference um, having that nature and that learning um, something new. Um, yeah. In my yeah. So this is the theme also. We, we talk about soundscapes today, how to buffer uh, against exhaustion disorder by using different soundscapes. And uh, this is a new wonderful research area. I would also like to go into that. So. Yes, we, we have a lot of things, I think, in common. It would be lo lovely and wonderful to meet with you in the future. And uh, I don't know if you have been to the Scandinavian countries or to Sweden. I have been to the Karolinska and mm -hmm. have presented there many years ago. Um, uh, I hope that someday when we can um, travel again, you know, and COVID's behind us, um, you'll invite me to come there and maybe we'll do a, 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 a retreat. Wonderful. I'm totally yeah. on. Yes. Thank Wonderful. You. That sounds fabulous. <laughs> I think we all want to go now. Um, Jennifer, yeah. or any. I want to go too. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, Eva, Sue, I wanna... Sorry, Sue Street here um, from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. I'm sorry, I just I came in late, but um, I just wanted to say I'm an occupational therapist and um, uh, I just, I. We've been using um, nature walks um, with our veterans who have come back from um, various um, military maneuvers, particularly for treating PTSD and as well for um, trying to help them reconnect um, with some of the emotional overload um, and stress um, issues uh, as a result of their military service and I just have to say your work is absolutely astounding and um, uh, like Karen uh, I think the retreat um, we often I often take my clients out into nature and we tend to walk um, when we're doing some of our sessions at least we were up until COVID and I have to say it just makes all the difference um, to be sort of outside um, in the fresh air and and really paying attention to the world around us as opposed to being uh, seconded in front of a, a, a screen or um, even sort of within a room, the, the confines of the room. So 
um, I just have to say it's just um, absolutely uh, brilliant work and uh, bravo Karen for um, getting this into the uh, into the journal it's just fantastic so bravo well I have to say thank you Sue um, for sharing that I would love to have a special issue of the journal on nature if anybody wants to do that oh fabulous Thank you for sharing your um, uh, experiences from Halifax, and uh, I, 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 I think you, you, you are absolutely on the right track to to use uh, nature walks and to not go into the into words. I think this non-verbal way of opening our emotional brain is also a key factor here. And because all the words are also constructions, we, we need to go sort of in, we need to connect to our primitive parts. And especially if you have a PTSD, you have a lot yes. of uh, alarm signals coming. And if you try to use uh, non-verbal experiences, I mean, drawing, walking, seeing, listening, to build yes. up some trust within on that, on that platform. I think that is a success factor. And if, actually, the, the art therapy started with uh, the veterans that, that we knew that there was this alexithymic factor as well involved. Alexithymia, which means that we have hard, it's dif dif have difficulties to verbalize emotions because we yes. have have so many traumatic uh, experiences so we we need to go sort of sneak into the back door in the brain and go uh, into the ex the the amygdala the emotional part of the brain and then start to reconstruct uh, a verbal language mm -hmm. out from those experiences that is filled with love trust uh, warmth etc so this is an absolutely important part because I think the whole uh, COVID will just explode when it comes to PTSD, COVID PTSD. Yes. And no one Absolutely. has been, you know, we haven't, we haven't seen this yet because it's still uh, a lockdown here in, in, in a lot of par parts of Europe, but we know for sure that the veterans and that that experience we will see the new veterans are the covid uh, fatigue veterans yes and um i just I, I would just add as well um i'm a percussionist and a pianist um sort of in my other life and so i tend to use um music um as a method of expression as well as for um, you know, trying to connect with the emotional pieces. And um, it's amazing to see clients. Um, I'll bring uh, bongos, timbales, um, various um, bass drums, and, and actually allow them, to, you know, encourage them to um, sort of use the instruments as a way of expressing some of their emotions. Um, turmoil as well as just being able to connect within that emotional core of themselves and yeah. it's amazing how the music transcends um, any verbal um, expression the verbal will come later but that just sort of um, almost raw sort of gut um, instinctual expression uh, from the music and then the connecting the emotional piece to that um, really um, it's it's quite amazing so um, so many great things I'm sorry I don't mean to, to take our time here but just um, it's absolutely brilliant and please send me your uh, email address because I would like to share a paper it's about we beat drums not each other. This is a wonderful yes. project here in the Nordic countries where we uh, invest in drums and we let teachers and students play drum and we see how they, uh, the, the whole uh, atmosphere it becomes more empathetic and etc. Yes. So I think this drum. Oh, wonderful. And, uh, so please send me your email address uh, there and, and I will send you some, some articles. 
Well, thank you so much. I will do that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, for this opportunity. It's really just absolutely brilliant. This is our the highlight of the of the month, I dare say. Oh, I'm so <laughs> happy to be here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and Eva, yeah. I just want to thank you again before we conclude and um, for Sue and, and Susan and Jennifer for being here as well. And um, Eva, you've inspired me to think about drums. So um, I've got noise going on here, so we're gonna conclude. And I just wanna thank you so much. And my thoughts and prayers are with your husband for- um, Yes. Recovery. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. It was a pleasure meeting with you. And it's a pity that I can't see you, but uh, we have tuned in our, our voices here in a way. <laughs> Absolutely. And and yes, uh, prayers uh, and healing uh, to you and your husband. And uh, we're thinking of him and hoping for a, a, a hope, a very you know, quick recovery. So I hope everyone stays well. Um, you know, just take care and stay safe. And, uh, and thank you for this um, great encouragement. It's uh, really fantastic. Karen, thank you for all this work. You're um, just absolutely stellar. Thank you. Thank you. So